I'm going to be pointing to the board, at least in theory. I suppose I expect to be pointing to the board a little bit more today than ordinarily. Um, so uh, it, the, the, the usual function of my, my equivalent of PowerPoint isn't quite the same today because I'm taking an interest in some of these diagrammatic matters as well. Uh, and as I say, I will, be, I will be pointing to them. All right, so to begin, I'm actually going to postpone something that you're probably already wondering about, although it will come into this lecture and on a couple of occasions. That is to say, the full relationship uh, in terms of the influence of both movements between the Russian formalists uh, and Saussure's notion of semiology and semiotics until next week when we discuss Roman Jakobson's essay, Linguistics and Poetics, where I think uh, the relationship between the two movements in which he himself was involved uh, will become clearer uh, and will come into focus more naturally than if I, tried to, if I tried to outline what the connection between the two movements is now. So that is an aspect of our sequence of lectures uh, beginning with the last one uh, that will be postponed until next week. Now, semiotics is not in itself a literary theory. Uh, as we'll learn from Jakobson next week, literature can be understood, or what he calls sort of the study of literature, poetics, can be understood as a subfield of semiotics. But semiotics is not in itself a literary theory. In other words, perhaps to your frustration, what you read today has nothing at all in and of itself to tell you about literature. This isn't the last time this will happen during the course of the syllabus. Uh, but then, of course, our job is to bring out the implications for literature of texts that we read um, that don't have any direct bearing on literary study. The important thing about Saussure and the, uh, the discipline of semiotics is the incredible influence that it, it has had on virtually every form of subsequent literary theory, and that, that's what we need to keep in mind. Uh, semiotics evolves into what is called structuralism, which we will be considering next week. Uh, and that, in turn, um, as it were, bequeaths its terminology and its set of issues and frameworks for thinking to, to deconstruction, to uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis, to French Marxism, to binary theories of race, colonization, and gender. In other words, to a great deal that we will be studying subsequently on this syllabus. Uh, so. While, again, what we read for today is not in itself literary theory, it is nevertheless crucially formative for a great many of the developments in literary theory that we'll be studying. Now, just as a, I don't know, an anecdotal or conjectural aside, I've always found it so fascinating, I can never resist talking about it. Um, the relationship you know, between various texts in our field, history of criticism, literary theory, texts that are considered foundational, which curiously enough, a la Foucault, don't actually have an author. Aristotle's Poetics, uh, we know actually not to have been one of the texts written by Aristotle, but rather to be um, a compendium of lecture notes put together by his students. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why uh, in the golden age of Arabic scholarship in the Middle Ages, uh, there was so much dispute about the poetics. The, the, the manuscripts we find from this period are full of marginal notes where the scholars are chiding each other and saying, no, 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 it can't be that way. Um, in other words, in a way, it's a disputed text. And it is not uh, written by Aristotle. It's a foundational text. Um, Aristotle is considered the father of criticism, um, and yet he is so as what Foucault would call a founder of discursivity. Well, the odd thing is it's exactly the same uh, with Saussure, who can be considered the father or patriarch of a certain kind of literary theory, as I've just indicated. Saussure's course in general linguistics is not something written by Saussure, but is a compendium 
of lecture notes written by his students in a series of lectures that he gave from 1906 to 1911. <coughs> Um, and then gathered together in book form uh, by, two of, by two of his disciples who were linguists. Now, it's odd that, we have a, that, that this text does have the same formative function. Scholars who go to Geneva uh, go for a variety of reasons when they look at the Saussure archive. Some of them are predisposed to dislike Saussure and to hope that they can somehow discredit him uh, by learning more about things that he thought that aren't actually in the text. Uh, others like Saussure and feel that he needs to be rescued <laughs> from his compositors. Um, and yet others go uh, in an attitude of worship and uh, hope that the archive will yield to them full confirmation of the integrity of the text we call the Course in General Linguistics. Uh, so that, in a way, the, stu the study of the Saussure archive, given the volatile relationship of that archive with the actual text that we have, um, is uh, a kind of map that, if one were to study it, one could associate with the history of thinking about literary theory in the 20th century. This is really all neither here nor there. I just find it interesting that two people who are incontestably <laughs> founders of discursivity in the field that we study uh, are in fact not, strictly speaking, authors, <laughs> somehow or another <laughs> confirming the, uh, the insight of Foucault in the essay that we began by reading. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, we have to try to figure out what Saussure is up to, and, uh, let's, and let's move on to begin to do so. Semiology. What is semiology? It's the study of existing conventional communicative systems. All of these systems we can call languages, and language, that is to say the words that we use when we speak to each other, is one of those systems. Other systems, the gestures that mimes use, semaphores, railroad semaphores, a stoplight, red, green, yellow, is a semiotic system. In other words, all of them are modes of communication with which we function, uh, the intelligibility of which allows us to negotiate the worlds around us. Semiotics um, has expanded into every, in, into every imaginable aspect of thought. There is, a, there is a Darwinian semiotics, understanding the relationships among species in semiotic terms. Uh, there is, in other words, uh, a semiotics of virtually every imaginable thing understood as a language made up of a system of signs. Signs we'll be getting to uh, in a minute. But in the meantime, it's important to understand what semiology actually is. That's what it is. Now, um, oh, I meant to ask you, how many of you did not bring uh, the passages that I sent to you by email last night? All right, we have them here, uh, and they'll be passed around. We have about 25 copies, so don't take one if you don't need it. I'm not going to pause. I am going to be turning to uh, the second passage on the sheet um, in which, uh, in which uh, something about the nature of these systems I think can be made clear. Language, says Saussure, is not a function of the speaker. And here, of course, he is talking about human language. Human language is not a function of the speaker. It is a product that is passively assimilated by the individual. Now, what does this mean? The fact that human language is not my language, that is to say, the fact that it doesn't originate in me, the fact that it's not, for, in other words, my private language, is, of course, a certain loss. Because it means that when I speak, when I use language in speech, I'm using something that is not strictly my own. It's conventional. That is to say, it belongs in the public sphere to all of us. And there's a, perhaps a certain sort of romantic loss in that. Wouldn't it be nice if language, in some sense, were my own? But the incredible gain which makes language 
something like at the object of science that Saussure is hoping to secure. This is one of the things, obviously, that he has in common with the formalists. The incredible gain is that if language is not private, if it's not my own, if it's not something that I can make up as I go along, if, if in other words, it is conventional, belonging to all of us, that's precisely what allows it to be communicated. It is a system of signs, in other words, that we can make use of, that we recognize as signs precisely because they exist among us as something that can be shared in common. And so this then is the object of Saussure's attention as a linguist uh, and as a semiotician. Now, What's implied in this idea is that language is something that we use. I don't, I mean, the, the, the best way to say it and the quickest way to say it is that I don't speak language. Language is something that exists as an aggregate all at once. Arguably, and this is something that's going to come up again as we, and again as we come back to these coordinates that we'll be touching on from time to time today also. Arguably, language is something virtual. You remember that Freud said we have to infer the unconscious from the er erratic behavior of consciousness. I mean, there's got to be something back there, so we're going to call it the unconscious and we're going to try to describe it. Very much the same with language, longed, as Saussure calls it. It's something, I mean, what we do is speak. And when we speak, of course, we say correctly that we use language. But we still need to know what language is, and we need to understand the relationship between language and speech. Now, we can understand language as a kind of aggregate of everything that's in the lexicon, in the dictionary, together with everything that would be in some sort of ideal or utterly systematized uh, rule, set of rules of grammar and syntax. But there is no real aggregate of, the aggregate of that kind. In other words, it exists. It's there to be put together, partly as a matter of experiment and partly as a matter of conjecture by the linguists. But as so as a composite thing existing in a spatial simultaneity, synchronically, language is something that, in a very real sense, as is the case with Freud, we infer from speech. Now, speech is what we do. Speech is the way in which we appropriate, deploy, and make use of language. And so Sir calls that parole. Parole is the unfolding in time of a set of possibilities given in space. That set of possibilities being sort of being what uh, Saussure calls long. Now, <coughs> language is a system of signs. What is a sign? Saussure's famous diagrams make it clear enough. We have above the line a concept, and we have below the line a sound image. In other words, I think of something, and that thinking, or, 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 I, or and that thinking of something corresponds to a sound image that I have ready to hand for it, and that can be understood in terms of thinking of the concept tree. That's why this is in quotation marks, and. I speak Latin, and, 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 and knowing that the, uh, the sound image correlative to the concept tree is our board, right? Or I can think of <laughs> something like that, uh, something in, in some way resembling that, and by the same token, I still speak Latin, uh, the sound image corresponding to it is our board. Now, I'm going to... I may or may not get back to this today, but in this question mark is the secret of deconstruction. All right, just just you know, just 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 just, just to just to keep you poised and on tender hooks. But in the meantime, what Saussure is doing with this relationship above and below the line is he's saying that there is an arbitrary relationship 
between the concept and the sound image. The concept he calls a signified, and the sound image he calls a signifier. A sign, in other words, is made up of two sides in a, as it were, a thought moment, the rela a relationship between that which is signified and that which signifies it. And it's, and, it, and it's to be understood that we have to think of them together. They're not divisible. Their relationship is necessary, but as we'll see in a minute, arbitrary. And each sign is like that. And the way in which we put signs together is to take these bundles, these binary relationships between a concept and a sound image and adjust them in an unfolding sequence. That's how we speak. That's how we make a sentence. All right, so in a way, the idea that a signifier, a, a, a sound that I make, arbor, refers to a concept and by implication, by very powerful and strong and necessary implication, not to a thing is not in itself new. The idea that a word signifies an idea and not an object is already fully developed in John Locke's essay on human understanding and is more or less commonly agreed on ever afterwards and is, as I say, uh, a, in itself a conventional thought that Saussure adapts and makes use of. But what is new in Saussure and what really is foundational in, the, in semiotics as a science is two things that Saussure then goes on to say about the sign. The first thing he has to say is that the signified signifier relationship, as I said, is arbitrary. And the second thing he has to say is the way is that the way in which we know one sign from another, either studying it, studying language in the aggregate, whereby clusters of signs exist in associational relation to each other, or studying it in speech acts in speech, whereby signs exist next to each other in a sequence, the way in which we understand what a sign is, is differential. So that what's new in Saussure's thinking about the relationship between signified and signifier is the sign tied up in this relationship is both arbitrary and differential. OK, this is a first walk through some essential ideas. I want to go back to the distinction between language and speech and refer you to the first passage, which now all of you have it, um, on your sheet. Because like the Russian formalists, Saussure is chiefly concerned in outlining what he means by semiology to establish the semiological project as a science. And like the Russian formalists, and in a way like the new critics talking about their academic colleagues, Saussure is vexed by the messiness and lack of system in the study of linguistics. And this is what he says in this first passage. He says, if we study speech from several viewpoints simultaneously, the object of linguistics appears to us as a confused mass of heterogeneous and unrelated things. This is speech. Uh, the, I, you know, I'm, I'm a linguist, and so what do I do? I study speech. I study speeches. And if I do so, and if I keep thinking about it in a variety of ways, all sorts of frameworks jostle for attention. So Sir continues, this procedure opens the door to several sciences, psychology, anthropology, normative grammar, philology, and so on, which are distinct from linguistics, but which might claim speech 
in view of the faulty method of linguistics as one of their objects. As I see it, there is only one solution to all the foregoing difficulties. From the very outset, and this is a rather <laughs> peculiar <laughs> mixed metaphor, from the very outset, we must put both feet on the ground of language and use language as the norm of all the other manifestations of speech. Well, it's, it's, it's as if he's trying to hold language down. <laughs> you know, stay there, stay there. We put both feet on the grounds of language so that we have it, so that we have it, so intelligible to us as a system, as something that can be understood precisely differentially, that can be understood in the variety of ways uh, in which uh, language uh, organizes signs. It might be worth pausing over the variety of ways in which we can think of signs in language, all of which have to do with the way in which a given sign might be chosen to go into a speech sentence. Uh, I don't know. Take the word, take the word ship. Uh, ship is very closely related in sound to certain other words. We won't specify them for fear of a Freudian slip. But, they are, but, but that is one cluster, that is one associational matrix or network that one can think of uh, in the arrangement of that sign in language. But there are also synonyms for ship, bark, boat, bateau, a uh, great many other synonyms, sailboat, whatever, uh, and they too exist uh, in a cluster, steamship, ocean liner. In other words, words that don't sound at all the same, but they're contiguous in synonymity. They cluster in that way. And then furthermore, ship is also the opposite of certain things. I mean, and that, so that it would also enter into uh, a relationship with train, car, truck, mule, modes of transportation, right? And in all of these ways, ship is clustered associationally in language in ways that make it available to be chosen, available to be chosen as appropriate for a certain semantic context that we try to develop when we speak. So that's the way, that's, that, that's the way uh, a sign works in language. I mean, this is, this is the, the tip of the iceberg for any given sign, but it gives you some, and, and by the way, uh, in what I'm saying, uh, I oversimplify by supposing that the basic constituent of unit of language is a word. The linguists know that that's not at all necessarily the case. Linguists uh, can work at different levels of abstraction with language. I mean, sometimes the basic unit is the phrase. Uh, but some other times, but, but the basic unit is the phoneme, that is to say the single sound unit, or if one's studying uh, language as a system of writing, it might be the syllable, uh, it could be the letter understood either graphically or audibly, um, and the variety of ways in which one can choose a basic unit in the study of linguistics uh, means that you need a special word for that unit, which is characteristically the tag meme. In other words, whatever, you, wh wh whatever you're thinking of as you're systematizing your understanding of language as the basic constituent unit, the word being probably one of the less popular choices, <laughs> even, even though that's the one I've just used, uh, it, it's prob the blanket term for that is the tag meme. Uh, and so uh, you, can, uh, you can understand the, associa the associational nature of signs also as tagmemic. Then, of course, um, since uh, there's a certain amount of se semantic payoff, let's say, if you're talking about a phoneme, uh, especially because, because of the, uh, the um, as Saussure will say, and as I'll get back to, misleading onomatopoetic drift of language. Perhaps a certain sound has certain connotations, meaning the sound may cluster uh, as sort of in, in an associational network. Um, but it, depending on the unit chosen, the, the associational networks will differ 
but they will still exist as a matrix. In other words, it is always probably. I mean, how else, how, how else could we have any sense of systematicity in language? It is always probably the case that when I speak, I won't choose just any word. E. e. Cummings actually boldly experimented with this principle, and, and he attracted the attention of the linguists, particularly a linguist named Del Himes. Um, e. 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 Cummings wrote sentences like, he danced his did, where did <laughs> is obviously not a word you would have supposed to be in any way involved in an associational cluster in language. You know, I mean, he danced as did. That is, in every sense, um, a misfire, as the as as the uh, as one school of thinking about language would call it. Uh, and yet, at the same time, uh, Cummings thumbs his nose at us and deliberately uses that word, almost as though he were issuing a critique uh, of semiotics. But at the same time, uh, such that uh, semiotics would probably have available to it. Uh, it's, 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 it's ways and means of refutation. Um, I, a certain amount of ingenuity is that all, all that's required to notice that uh, d uh, uh, reiterates the d, the d sound in danced, uh, and that there are all sorts of combinatory pressures uh, on his consciousness to choose did as opposed to some other seemingly irrelevant word. But in any case, um, uh, so, so in any case, you can still, even with these egregious examples, understand language, even in its infinite variety, nevertheless as uh, uh, associational uh, and as clustering its available signs in ways that make them more readily to hand for choice uh, than they might be um, uh, all other things being equal. Well, in any case, so language is a system of signs. Uh, the signs are both arbitrary and differential. Now, what does this mean? Uh, this is actually the second thing, maybe, that we learn under the influence of what we call literary theory and the thinking that surrounds it about the nature of perception. If the sign is both arbitrary and differential, that is to say, if there is no such thing as a natural sign, something that is linked by nature, by the nature of the thing and the word together with a thing. If on one side of the, of the border, as Saussure puts it, we look at a cow and say, ox, and if on the other side of the border we look at a cow and say, boof, and if we cross a considerable body of water and we look at a cow and say cow, uh, plainly the relationship between the thing and the sign, you know, the, 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 the matrix signifier signified, just doesn't exist. So signs are arbitrary and they're also differential. I have to be able to distinguish between all the signs I use in any communicative sequence. And how do I do it? By putting in signs which are not other signs. The sign is not linked to the natural world by any natural means, and the sign is not linked to other signs by any natural means. I don't know a unit of language which I use to commu communicate with you positively. I know it negatively. I know it only because it is not everything else in, in, in the terms of its direct relationship with the thing that's most adjacent to it somehow, either through similarity or dissimilarity. It's not that other thing. But generally speaking, the point about a sign is that it's not any other thing. This is true even of homonyms. This is true even of, 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 of seemingly uh, identical signs because each has its use value uh, and, and is only intelligible as it's that which it, which it exists to mean um, in a certain context. So 
uh, it is always the case that I can only know what I know if it's a question of being communicated with, having something rendered intelligible for me negatively. I can't know it because it just is either that sign or that is. I don't know it positively. I'm about to give, I'm about to give an example of this, which I, hope, which, which I hope will flesh out what I'm trying to get across. In the meantime, a couple of passages in Saussure uh, that may make the point. Now, not on this version of your sheet, uh, but on the version, uh, the, not on the version of the sheet that I passed out today, but on the version that I sent electronically last night, there's a fifth passage. And that passage is actually a combination of formulations of Saussure that are on two separate, that are in two separate parts of your text. The first one is on page 844. Can this possibly be correct? I, <laughs> I hope it can. Um, uh, no, it is not uh, c correct. It's page 845, the lower left-hand column, where Saussure says, Language is a system of interdependent terms in which the value of each term results solely from the simultaneous presence of the others, as in the diagram just below it. In other words, the value of a term, I, 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 I say something. The value of the term, of, I, I, I utter a sound. The value of that sound cannot be determined except by its context. I can't know it except by the way in which it differs from everything that surrounds it. And he goes on to say, this is on page 847, about halfway down the left-hand column. He goes on to say, a segment of language can never in the final analysis be based on anything except its non-coincidence with the rest. Arbitrary and differential are two correlative qualities. Now, why don't, and, and, then, and then again, um, uh, uh, an, another passage on page 846, the right-hand column, halfway down. Concepts are purely differential and defined not by their positive content, but negatively by their relations with other terms of the system. Now, probably this is hard to accept intuitively. We feel as we process the world around us that we know things for and as what they are. We feel, you know, I look at something and I know what it is, forgetting that possibly I only know what it is be because of a context in which indeed it is not those other things that are linked to it. Now, I want to take, as, I want to take an example. Uh, I could use any example, but I'm going to use something which plainly does move around various semiotic systems. It's, it's a piece of language, but it also belongs to other sorts of semiotic system, as we'll immediately see. I want to use the example of the red light. Now. In a stoplight, which is probably just about the simplest semiotic system that we have, it only has three, one is tempted to say variables, uh, plainly differing from each other, red, yellow, and green, we have two ways of thinking about the red light. If we think that our knowledge is positive, we say red, in a red light, means stop. It is spontaneous to us to say, red light means stop. Now, if all we have to go on is just this semiotic system, it's going to be kind of hard to put up resistance to that sort of thinking. Because by the same token, we'll say yellow means pause, green means go. These, do, these three lights, with their respective colors, just do positively mean these things. Everybody knows it, uh, and I'm certainly not thinking when I approach an intersection 
that uh, when, I, when the red light goes on, I, I'm not saying to myself, oh, not yellow, not green. You know, it, my, <laughs> my, 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 mind, my mind just doesn't work that way. All right, but still, it's a red light, right? And our hypothesis is that the red light has positive value in the sense that it means a certain thing. It means, we say, stop. Well, <clears throat> suppose the red light appeared on or as the nose of a reindeer. In that case, the red light would be a beacon, which means forward, go, follow me. Damn the torpedoes, right? <laughs> We've got to get these presents distri distributed. No time, no time to waste, you know. And we race off, you know, uh, who perhaps risking an accident. Who knows? <laughs> we, we race off uh, under the compulsion of the meaning of the red light, which is go. Right? Now, by the way, there's an anecdote, the truth of which I've never been able to ascertain, that um, during the Cultural Revolution in China, Madame, now, Madame Mao uh, very much disapproved of the fact that red lights meant stop, because red is, of course, the color of progress. Uh, it ought to mean go forward uh, and, you know, and, 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 and everything behind it. Um, but needless to say, uh, her thoughts on the subject were never implemented, <laughs> because you know, if one day red light means stop, and the next day, red light means go, uh, there might be a few problems. And so, um, and, 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 and this, by the way, is a way of showing the, 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 the fact that, um, that everything which appears in a semiotic system is conventional, right? I mean, it is, it, it, th there's an emptying out of positive meaning in the very awareness that, after all, the red light could mean go. I'm about to go on and give more examples. Uh, it's conventional. Whatever the convention is within a system of differences, that's what makes the sign intelligible. All right, just some other examples. A red light over a street door. Well, that doesn't mean stop. That means go in, come in, right? Uh, it's, and, and of course, it exists in a semiotic relationship to a white light over a street door, which means this is my house. Um, if you wish, you can ring the bell, but I just assume you stayed out. This light is probably on to keep burglars away, uh, and so stop, right? And the, and, and, the, and the red light is intelligible, in other words, within that, within that semiotic system. Now, over an auditorium door, and of course we've already been gazing at that light back there, uh, and it's not a good example. I wish it didn't say exit, but it does say exit because that, that sort of that kind of weakens my point. Um, but, but over many auditorium doors, uh, a red light just hangs there. And obviously it doesn't mean come in in the sense of the red light over a street door. It means go out, right? This is the way out. This is the way you get out of here, not this is the way you get in here. I mean, there are a lot of, there, there are a lot of ways in which a red light means neither stop nor go, but we are sort of confining ourselves so far to the ways in which a red light has something to do with locomotion or the lack thereof. And in each new system, in each new system, you can see it takes on a new meaning, always with respect to whatever it is not. All right, now, uh, well, I mean, we can continue. On a light up valentine means don't stop, go. You know, it has, this, it, it, it has the same function, in other words, of negating its own meaning in another semiotic system, in this case, the semiotic system of the stoplight. On an ambulance or a police car, Admittedly, many of these lights are blue these days, but let's suppose, let's suppose that you know, tradition prevailing that they, they are still red. Um, on an ambulance or a streetcar, they mean get out of the way or stop. Right? In, other words, in, in other words, they probably bear a distant relation to the semiotics of the stoplight. And that's probably why red was chosen. Uh, for ambulances and police cars because they put into your head the notion of stop.
But it's a notion that's complicated in this case by the equally imperative notion, get out of the way, which doesn't at all necessarily entail stopping, but rather accelerating uh, in a different direction. Uh, and, all, and, and, and all of that somewhat complicates the picture, but at the same time, I think you can see that there's a connection between those semiotic systems. It's, it's, it's a weak system in terms of color. In the case of ambulance and police car, it's more a question of brightness. As I say, red tends to be chosen, but then you know, if you get lab experiments showing that that particular color of gas blue is somehow or another you know, sort of more invasive of your consciousness than red is, then you, know, you move away from the arbitrariness of the choice of red as a color. Um, and as I say, there's a certain instability, which, which could never apply in the semiotics of the stoplight, because there it's not so much a question of the brightness of the color, although that has been experimented with, as you know, um, but rather the insistence that the color is just that color. And then finally, and here is where, in a way, this is perhaps the most interesting thing, because, because it forces us to show the complexity, to see the complexity of semiotic relationships. A red light, just to return to the Christian holiday, a red light on a Christmas tree. Now, our first thought is, oh, ha ha, that has no meaning, right? You know, it's, not, it's no use talking about the negative relationship between a red light and a green light and a yellow, white, blue, whatever, whatever the other colors on the Christmas tree are, because they all have the same value. They're all bright, they're all cheerful, they all say Merry Christmas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what are you supposed to do with that? Here you've got a red light which doesn't seem to enter into this sense of the arbitrary and differential. Well, that's because it's actually not a gross constituent unit, right? Bright lights <laughs> is the gross constituent unit. And the variety of those bright, bright, bright lights, which is a matter of aesthetics, uh, uh, the variety of those bright lights is, ironically enough, neutralized by the common signifier governing our understanding of them, which is bright lights, in this case particularly on a tree, or festooning another ornament that has some sort of comparable value. And once you get that, once you get the value Christmas tree, as opposed to red lights, red lights being perhaps a part of some Christmas trees, then you see that you're back in a semiotic system in a very obvious one, because a Christmas tree is a not menorah, a not Kwanzaa candles. A Christmas tree, in other words, is a sign that can only be understood intelligibly in terms of a certain cultural understanding. And we think, of course, ah, you know, I mean, we know what that is. And of course, probably we do. But we're misled in supposing that that's the key to the understanding of it as a sign. Because it's very possible to imagine a circumstance in which someone wouldn't know what it was, forcing us, despite its familiarity, to, its familiarity, to ask us, well, what is it? And how do we know what it is? And then we realize, once again, that we can only know what it is if we, under, if we come to understand, in this case, probably it's best to say a cultural system, understood as a semiosis, a cultural system, within which it appears. And so this last version of the red light uh, introduces interesting complications, which I don't think should confuse. I think they should actually show us a little bit more about how we can understand uh, the organization of the things around us and within us as systems of signs. We know that we've already learned from Heidegger and the hermeneutic tradition that we know them as something. But it remains to show how we know them. That is to say, we don't know them positively. I mean, Heidegger raises the interesting fact that we spontaneously recognize something. And that makes us, and that, and, but that's one of the things which could be dangerous for semiotics because it would make us think or assume that we know, them, that we know things positively. Without thinking, in other words, I know that that's an exit sign. I don't know that it's a white thing with red marks on it. I know that it's an exit sign. 
But I can't know that. The Saussurian argument is without knowing that it is not all the things that it's not. If it were all the things that it's not, or if it were identical to all the things that somehow or another it's not, then I would be in a very diff difficult situation because I wouldn't have any means of knowing it in particular. The very fact that I need to know it in particular is what makes me need to know it negatively. And that is, it seems to me, in other words, we, we now know two things about how we perceive things from the, fr fr from the standpoint of this subject matter. Uh, and, I and it's very useful to put them together. The fact that we always know things first. But at the same time, the fact that it's misleading to think that, that our knowing them first means that we know them positively. We know them first, but we also know them negatively, in negation to other things. OK, so let me just return once again to the way in which sign systems are intelligible. Because, you know, I mean, lots of, there are going to be lots of moments in a course like this in which what we seem to be saying is, oh, we can't know anything, or we don't know what we know, or how do we know what we know? And, and maybe, we're, maybe we're skirting uh, rhetorical questions of that kind. But we're really not. What we're talking about today is how we do know things. Right. That, I mean, that's, I mean if, we take, if we take semiotics seriously, it gives us a rather sophisticated means of understanding precisely how we know things. But it insists that we know things because of their conventional nature. That is to say, because they are conventions existing within a system of conventions. Insofar as we don't recognize them, things, signs, as existing because if, we, if we're thinking about a thing, we're thinking about that thing as a sign in semiotics. If we don't uh, know that, if we don't recognize its existence in a system, if we can't think what system it belongs to, perhaps to put it in a better way, that's tantamount to saying we really don't know what it is. And I think the more we think about it, the more we realize that we only know what it is if we know the system that it belongs to which is to say, all of the things related to it which it is not. OK, so the intelligibility of sign systems is their conventionality. That's why it's impossible for anybody to come along and say, oh, I don't like the fact that the red light is red. It's symbolically the wrong move. Let's make the red light a, the symbol of go. You know, I mean. You know, with the ecological movement, it would be very difficult to make the green light the symbol of stop. But in, in any case, all, all, sorts of, all sorts of complications would arise. Right? But in the meantime, you see that we can't mess with conventional systems by imposing the individuality of our will on them and expecting anything to change. A seeming, a seeming exception is the fact that sometimes individuals can, by, through the exertion of their influence and prestige, actually change the way we speak about things. This is a seeming exception. Think about the way Jesse Jackson almost single-handedly convinced us that we should use the expression African American, even though it's a cumbersome polysyllabic expression, which you would think somehow or another would be intuitively rejected, because it's so hard to say. But it worked. He convinced us all to say African American. And you say to yourself, aha, there's an example of somebody taking language by the scruff of the neck and changing it as an individual, exerting an individual will over against the conventional nature of language. The answer, the, sem the, the semiotician's answer to this is, it never could have happened simply as an act of agency, as an act of will. It had to be acquiesced in. You needed the community that c makes use of linguistic conventions to acquiesce in a change of use. Remember, language exists synchronically. It only exists 
in a moment, in a moment of simultaneity. We study language diachronically. That is to say, we study its history. We study its unfolding in time. Now, this unfolding is not, according to the semiotician, and here's another link with the Russian foremost, is not a question, is not a question of studying the way in which language is changed from without. That is to say, studying the way in which, for example, an individual can rise up and insist on changing one of the signs, but rather a, si a sequence of synchronic cross-sections. From moment to moment, language changes. But if we're to understand it as language, we have to honor its simultaneity. And in that case, we understand it as a sequence of cross-sections rather than something that somehow organically changes through time. Uh, and at each cross-section, people are either willing to use a certain sign in a certain way, or they're not. That's the crucial thing. If they're not willing, the use of the sign doesn't work, which confirms the idea that nothing can be changed simply by individual agency in and of itself. All right, I, I need to come back to synchrony and diachrony. Um, I'll do so uh, next time uh, and probably in subsequent lectures because we're going to keep using these coordinates. We're going to keep using the things that exist in space, virtual or not, and the things that unfold in time in their relationship with each other as we continue to try to understand these basic principles uh, which shape so much of subsequent literary theory. Thank you. <laughs>